Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Um, MC Owens, and this is going to be part two of our deep dive, our <clears throat> our deep study of the Manifestation of Lights Sutra. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I just mentioned this is going to be part two because last week we opened this new Dharma door. Um, and so I kind of went over last week, I went over that this is the Maharatna Kuta Sutra number 11. So we're sticking with our normal Sunday night collection of sutras. And I introduced the, the basic background of the sutra a little bit. And the main thing, <clears throat> the main thing that I was trying to do last week, although I didn't even say this explicitly it's really what i was trying to do last week so this sutra is the manifestation of lights and this is all about a um it's a theme this is what i spoke about last week it's a theme in the world of buddhism and buddhist sutras where the the buddha emits light <clears throat> sometimes he emits light out of his forehead sometimes out of the bottoms of his feet, sometimes out of his chest. <clears throat> so it's a theme within the world of Buddhism for the Buddha to admit this light. And this is a sutra that is entirely about that theme. That's all that it's about in this way is, is this light. And what I wanted to do last week was to really try to avoid anyone having an image of a basically even though i draw these things on the board i actually don't want you to be thinking ex like explicitly of like light beams coming off of a being it, i know that that's what they're saying is happening and i know that again i know that i draw that but what I was talking about last week, even though we read a little bit of the sutra, I mainly was talking about light. And what I wanted to do mainly was complicate our thinking about light. In, in other words, we, if, if we think about it, there's a way in which we only have one idea of light. And last week I was calling it uh, whatever, regular light, terrestrial light, reflective light, photonic light, you know, all light that comes from lamps and things like that. And what I wanted to do last week was open up the possibility for there being kind of other forms of light. And, and so that we would not necessarily have the view of a, a being emitting light and and in particular actually what i would like to remind you of as well is that <clears throat> i transitioned to this sutra because at the end of the last sutra that we were studying the buddha emitted a light and in that sutra that we studied for weeks last that was the Sri mala devi sutra the the lion's roar of queen Sri mala that whole sutra, if you, especially if you sat through all those sessions, that whole sutra was about this other way of seeing the Buddha, this other way of thinking of the Buddha. And what I mean is, is a, a different way than thinking of the Buddha as a person, especially thinking of the Buddha as a historical person by which I would then mean deceased, gone, just a memory. The sutra that we led, read last time, and very much the sutra that we're getting into tonight, this Buddha is not from the past. This Buddha that we're talking about is not a person per se. But what is that Buddha? Well, that you know, see the last sutra if you want to kind of dive more into that idea of this more uh, Dharma Kaya, the Dharma body of the Buddha. But the idea again is, is that this sutra is already operating in that realm, the realm where the Buddha isn't just a person, isn't a historical figure, but is some sort of pr present possibility. I almost want to 
say in that sense. <clears throat> okay. So last week was all about light, different ideas of light. In order to address this uh, seemingly very strange sutra. So just to remind you, the, the pretense under which this sutra takes place is that this young child, I believe they just call him a young boy. I don't think they give him an age, but his name is Moonlight. And of course, <laughs> In a sutra that's called the Manifestations of Lights, that's all about the Buddha's various lights. It's you know it's kind of interesting that this uh, figure, the person asking the questions, is called Moonlight. So there's a lot of imagery going on in this sutra, and again, my kind of my main goal last week was not in any way. <laughs> to to define the the light of this sutra again i was trying to complicate it and expand our thinking so that we could maybe think outside of uh photonic light in that sense so that's the theme of the sutra that's the uh our little young boy moonlight asks the buddha and really quickly, let me just uh, remind you of the question very quickly. The young boy, Moonlight. So at that time, from among the assembly, a young boy known as Moonlight arose from his seat, bared his right shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground, bowed down with his head at the Buddha's feet, joined his palms reverentially together, and said, World honored one. What karmic actions has the tathagata the thus come one practiced in order to attain such certain light the embracing light generating light manifesting light all kinds of colors of lights indistinguishable light narrow light, broad light, pure light, universally pure light, undefiled light, most undefiled light, stainless light, gradually increasing light, sparkling pure light, the most sparkling pure light, boundless light, most boundless light, immeasurable light, most immeasurable light, measureless light, most measureless light, swift light, most swift light, non-abiding light, a light with no abode, blazing light, illuminating light, delightful light, light that reaches the other shore, light that is unable to be obstructed, immovable light, straightforward light, light that abides in infinitude, colored light, all kinds of colors of lights, measureless colors of lights, blue, yellow, red, white colored light, red colored light, crystalline colored light, space colored light. All kinds of lights such as this, each one intermingling with the lights of the five colors, the blue, the yellow, the red, the white, and so on, each one appearing mixed with innumerable boundless different kinds of colors of light. So that's the question. <clears throat> how did the Buddha, Buddha, world honored one, how did you come to attain all of these different kinds of lights? <clears throat> so I wanted to reread the question in, in full for a reason. So this sutra I mentioned last week, it's one very long poem. The Buddha gives his answer in this really long poem. And a little while later, actually, little boy Moonlight will have a few more questions and he will present them in the form of verse, in the form of a poem. And, the, and I also mentioned last week that our normal standard English translation that we work with usually on Sunday nights, 
I've mentioned that they cut, they've cut out a lot. And the more that I go through working on my own translation, the more I realize exactly how much they've cut out. So I'm going to share with you sort of that, but I wanted to read the, the question again with all of these different lights. I wanted to read it again because the idea is, is that this is one of those kinds of sutras that it really is sort of a meditation just to read it or to hear it. Meaning, yeah, we're, we're going to go through the, the meaning of, of all of this, and we're going to talk about the words, and we're going to you know, talk about the ideas, but there's also a way that there's a kind of um, rhythm to the poetry of the sutra, a sutra like this, where it's kind of operating on a few different levels where yes, the words and the ideas and the information that's being delivered is significant, but there's also a sense in which the repetitions are meant to kind of work on us, that the, the cadence, again, the kind of the flow of the whole thing is part of the, it's part of the sutra in that way. So I want to do my best to kind of give us the feeling for this sutra. In, in other words, I would like to read it, you know, for a while without stopping in that way. But at the same time, it's also a little dense and there's a lot of different ideas. So I'm going to do my best to kind of balance that of, of reading without stopping, but also trying to make clear what's going on here. Um, the first part of the Buddha's answer, and he has a few different parts. Um, the first part is a hundred verses long. I forget exactly how many they have in here, like how many they cut out, um, but it's about a hundred verses. Before the hundred verses, though, the Buddha says, and so this is the Buddha's answer to the young boy Moonlight of how he, he came to acquire all of these different lights. And the Buddha says to Moonlight in verse that it's due to inconceivable virtuous karmic actions that I have been completely freed of confusion and have achieved all kinds of lights. It's also due to all kinds of past practices abiding in the way of the Buddhas by the wisdom of emptiness and the wisdom of non-doing that intermingled lights emerge. It is like all external phenomena, like all dharmas, differentiated by all kinds of characteristics when within they are but empty thoughts without self, action or mind. It's also like the internal body, empty as well, without a self, without a doer, when within it is able to manifest all kinds of sounds. Just as there is no doer manifesting boundless different colored lights according to whatever delights the mind, causing each to attain fulfillment. So that's the introduction where the Buddha says that it's from past virtuous karmic action that he's attained all of these lights. And in particular, being freed of confusion, being freed of de delusion, moha in that sense, one of our three kleshas, the main three afflictions, along with greed and anger, talking about being freed of confusion. And then the Buddha makes this comparison that just as you and me, just as all beings ultimately have no self, what the sutra calls no doer, no agent, right? This is the idea of anatta or anatman. Buddha says, just like that, how within there's no doer. And yet, look, here's all these sounds coming out of my mouth. <laughs> oh, look, here's all of this 
these sounds, right? Well, the Buddha seems to be saying that just like that, <laughs> In the same way that there's no doer here, yet there's the production of all these sounds, there is no doer, yet there is the production of all these lights, is sort of what the Buddha is saying. So he's making this really strong equation. He's saying that this not being confused, not being deluded about the nature of the self, understanding no self, no doer, emptiness in that sense, that that's what sort of allows for the emergence of these different lights. So that's just the intro. Then we get into the lights. And this is pretty much where I kind of stopped last time. I know I read a little bit, but regarding all of these lights, the next hundred verses all have basically the same format. Um, and I'll let you know too, just to, just to let you know that this is in a very kind of um, formal structure, at least in the Chinese. And actually you could probably be able to see it. So in the Chinese, they are in these five character sets and that makes up one of the stanzas. And there's a hundred of those. And each one has the same basic structure where the Buddha says from a single light, two colors of light emerge, but then he's going to go on to say three colors, four colors, five colors, six colors, seven. So it's going to keep going, but he says that it's from a single light that two colors, three, four, or five colors emerge. Each of those has an upper, a middle, and a lower. And I spoke about this last time that there's a few different ways you could read that. And then it's going to say, what caused these lights to emerge? So, for example, it is from a single light that two colors emerge, each with an upper, middle, and a lower. Differentiated is how they appear. Or it is from a single light that three colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower differentiated is how they appear. Or from a single light, four colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. Differentiated is how they appear. Or from a single light, five colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is the result of pure karmic action that they arise. Or it is from a single light that six colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. And it is from upaya, skillful means, that they arise. Or it is from a single light that seven colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from virtuous karmic action that they arise. Or it's from a single light that eight colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from superior virtue that they arise. Or it is from a single light that nine colors of light emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from sambraha spiritual supplies that they arise, or it is from a single light that 10 colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from dana, generosity, that they arise. All right, I'm gonna pause there just to get us back, back together. And then we're going to go for a little while. So you see, they're all going to have that same structure, but from a single light, we're going to keep getting more and more lights. Okay. Also, each of those colors, those multiple colors that arise from a single light, we are going to find out that they each have an upper and a middle and a lower. 
And then, for example, we found out that nine colors emerge, each with an upper, middle, and a lower, and it's from Sambraha that they arise. Sambraha is, it's a term, it's come up a few times in Dharma doors, but it's usually translated as spiritual supplies. And it's usually about food offerings and wisdom offerings. And so the idea is like spiritual supplies are a little bit of food and a sutra, good luck, <laughs> is sort of the idea. And so part of within the realm of Mahayana Buddhism for the Bodhisattva practice, they talk a lot about Sambraha. And this is this sort of equal, equal a measure for the body and equal measure for the mind. You need to feed the body and you need to feed the mind. And so the Sambraha are about making sure that everybody has the supplies that they need. So that is that emerges, or I should say the nine colors emerge from that. Then when we get to 10 colors, it says that it is from dana or generosity that those 10 colors arise. And this is where I really wanna take a, another pause and kind of address how this sutra is working. So there's a lot of different ways to teach, a lot of different ways to learn. And this is one of those sutras that it's kind of teaching by exposure. And I suppose that's a funny word to choose regarding all of this light, um, but it, 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 this is gonna kind of a sutra that teaches by exposure, meaning it's, it's not really, like when it says that 10 colors emerge from a single light and that happens because of dana, generosity, there's kind of a way that they haven't really told us anything, except they've reinforced the importance of generosity. <laughs> that's all that's kind of happened in a way. You could get a little esoteric, and there's plenty of room for esotericism in, in this sutra, where you could really try to start, basically, you would try to figure out what exactly they're talking about with these lights. And what I mean is, why is Dana? 10 colors. I bet you a bunch of uh, folks watching though will know what 11 colors, where 11 colors come from. <laughs> maybe Sheila, maybe moral discipline, the second paramita. And, and that's another place where this is a kind of teaching by exposure, which is that if you are a bodhisattva, or if you are a student of dharma in that way, and you know your paramitas, you know your six paramitas, starting with giving, moral discipline, patience, determination, meditation, and wisdom. If you know your six paramitas, then when you hear that it is sing from a single light that 10 colors of light emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower, and that it's from dana, from generosity that they arise. If you know your paramitas, you're like, oh, I, I bet, I bet you anything, Sheila is next. <laughs> In other words, it's kind of almost a little quiz of your knowledge of Buddhism as well. And sure enough, or it's from a single light that 20 colors emerge each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from Shila, moral discipline, that they arise. Or it is from a single thing or a single light that 30 colors emerge, each with an upper, middle, and a lower. It is from Kashanti, patience, that they arise. Or it is from a single light that 40 colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from virya, determination, that they arise. Or 
it is from a single light that 50 colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from dhyana, meditation, that these arise. Or it is from a single light that 60 colors emerge, each with an upper, middle, and lower. It is from pranya, wisdom, that they arise. What's next? Or it is from a single light that 70 colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from metta, loving kindness, that they arise. Or it is from a single light that 80 colors emerge, each with an upper, middle, and lower. It is from compassion, karuna, that they arise. Or it is from a single light that 90 colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from mudita, empathic joy, that they arise. Or it is from a single light that a hundred colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from upeksha, or as the sutra literally says, it is from an unattached mind that they arise. Or it is from a single light that a thousand colors emerge. It is from, oh, sorry, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from a thousand merits that they arise. Or it is from a single light that 10,000 colors of light emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from the blessings received from Sambraha, those spiritual supplies, that those lights arise, or those colors arise. Or it is from a single light that a koti of colors emerge, a koti being a million or 10 million, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from rejoicing for the welfare of others that they arise. Or it is from a single light that two kotis, two million colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from pure faith that they arise. Or it is from a single light that three million colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from Prashrabri, Prashrabi Sambodhyanga that they arise. And that term means getting rid of the weight of the body. <laughs> it is from getting, ridding the gross weight of the body and mind, actually, that they arise. Or it is from a single light that four koti, four million colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from honoring the Buddha that they arise. Or it is from a single light that five koti, five million colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from honoring the Dharma that they arise. Or it is from a single light that six koti, six million colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from honoring the Sangha that they arise. Or it is from a single light that seven koti, seven million colors of light emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from honoring the discipline that they arise. 
or it is from a single light that eight koti, eight million colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from honoring meditation that they arise, or it is from a single light that nine koti, nine million of colors emerge, each with an upper, middle, and lower. It is from universal compassion that they arise. Or it is from a single light that 10 koti, 10 million colors emerge, each with an upper, a middle, and a lower. It is from not being too slack that they arise. Okay, I'm going to pause there because that's actually a... Um, the language of the sutra or the poem changes at that point. Anybody have anything coming up? Questions, answers, ideas about all these lights, these ideas? Any terms come up so far? So, again, a lot of these are just, um, you know, we went through the six paramitas, for example. And then right after the six paramitas, we shifted into what are called the four immeasurables, right? Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeksha, classic. And by the way, too, in Mahayana sutras, the six paramitas and the four immeasurables are often grouped together. Um, then we get into all of the kotis, and that word koti, K-O-T-I, is this Sanskrit term for, it's usually translated as a million, but it's kind of one of those numbers that's, I often like to say that, you know, in Sanskrit, there's a few different numbers, and they're kind of similar to the English gajillion. <laughs> you know how we have this English word, a gajillion? And it means a lot. And like, is it more than a million? Yeah, it's more than a million. It's a gajillion. A koti is kind of like that, where it, it really doesn't have an exact number. It's a lot. And but then you can have one koti, two kotis, three kotis. And so we saw all of the different um, things produced by that, or by the all the kotis of light. Question? Yes. Uh, just. Real quick, Michael, um, going back to spiritual supplies of food and wisdom, um, this would have been written, you know, 2000 years ago. And I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, in terms of a sutra, would that mean like an, an individual person reading from the sutra directly or like me hearing you read from the sutra or would it be more like uh explaining the sutra explaining the wisdom of the sutra it i wonder what if they meant something specific among those excellent so great question dean you you've reminded me i i, I want to make something even more clear so it, it, there's a way in which the later on in the poem, it makes this more clear. So each of the, the lights that we just described and this idea that um, like, let me go grab the, the one that you're mentioning, the Sambraha, the spiritual supplies. So just really quickly, that verse reads from a single light nine colors emerge each with an upper middle and a lower and it's from sambraha that those are colors arise what uh, let me be very clear about the sutra the the buddha emits all this light and our little boy moonlight is asked the buddha wow like what what did you do what have you done to radiate such light or emit such light. And what we are, how one should read this is he, the Buddha saying, well, like this light beam, I mean, well, I have this one light and this one light 
actually turns into all these different colors, each of those with an upper, a middle, and a lower. And I attained or I emit that light because in the past, I practiced this sambraha. And the sambraha is actually making gifts of food and knowledge by which Dean, anything that you mention, you could literally give somebody a sutra or you could give them the knowledge that's in the sutra. But what the Buddha is teaching us, what the Buddha is telling us is that we too could emit such light through the practice of sambraha or through the practice of dana, all the paramitas, through metta, karuna, mudita, upeksha. So this is a big lesson in all of the practices of Buddhism and mentioning these specific lights that you too will develop if you practice these things. Sound good? good. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Great question. All right, and so um, where's the shift? Okay, so at that point, the Buddha says, and this is all still part of the same big old hundred line uh, first part of the poem. So the Buddha says, also from a single hair pore, also manifest such lights as I just described, lights with all kinds of names, of which I will now tell you. I have a light known as cloud of pure radiance. Its glow arises from the accumulation of immeasurable virtuous roots. In the past, Seeing sentient beings who are suffering from all kinds of afflictions, it always gave rise to a sympathetic mind. And therefore I gave all kinds of medicines causing them to restore their health. As a consequence, I attained this light. I also have a light known as pure eyes. It arose by offering lamplight to Buddhas. I also have a light known as pure ear. It arose by offering music. I also have a light known as pure nose. It arose from offering scented fragrant waters. I also have a light known as pure tongue. It arose by offering excellent flavors. I also have a light known as pure body. It arose by offering raiment or clothing. I also have a light known as pure mind. It arose from always having faith and delighting in the Buddha. All right, I wanna pause there again really quickly. So we've entered this new part of the poem where the Buddha is, he's, they, it's changed the, it's still five characters, five characters, five characters, five characters but he's changed it a little bit. And the formula, the structure of each stanza reads, I also have a light called, some, and then it'll have a different name. And then the Buddha says what caused it to arise. And you'll note it, you know, I'm sure I don't have to explain this, but I, I just like to point it out this beautiful pairing where this idea of like, oh, the Buddha says, I also have a light known as, right, pure nose. And that light arose from offering scented waters. 
right? So you're getting these beautiful correspondences between the name of the light, which in these cases is each of the sensory organs, and then this act of offering. In the other translation, they have it as, I also have a light known as pure nose, for example, it arose by offering scented fragrant waters to the Buddha. Now, I think it's, I think you could probably do that. If you remember the very first of these was, I also have a light known as pure eyes. It arose by offering lamp light to Buddhas. I think it's safe to assume that all of these are those types of offerings. And, you know, the, an image of a, of a temple altar where one is presenting and making offerings is probably what should be coming to mind. In the same way, though, that I said before that this sutra is just teaching by exposure. In the same way that we heard the six paramitas and then we heard the four immeasurables, all of those things. Here, we, are, are, we just got a section which went from the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and then the sixth one was, right, I also have a light known as pure brain, pure mind, and it arose from always having faith and delighting in the Buddha. So those are the six, sense, six senses, right, or six sensory organs. So now, check out the next six. I also have a light known as pure visible form. It arose from painting images of the Buddha. I also have a light known as pure sound. It arose from always praising the Dharma. I also have a light known as pure scent. It arose from always praising the Sangha. I also have a light known as pure flavor. It arose from giving in accordance to what is needed. I also have a light known as pure texture. It arose from offering ointments. I also have a light known as pure dharma or idea, thought, mind object, that kind of dharma. So I also have a light known as pure mind object or pure dharma. It arose from embracing or parigraha, embracing all dharmas, all phenomena. Now we move into a new section. I also have a light known as pure earth element. It arose from sweeping the ground before the Buddha and the Sangha. I also have a light known as pure water element. It arose from offering wells and springs. I also have a light known as pure fire element. It arose from holding fires as offerings. I also have a light known as pure wind element. It arose from fanning or making offerings of fanning. I also have a light known as pure skandhas, pure aggregates. It arose from offering the body to the Buddha. I also have a light known as pure realms. It arose from always practicing with a kind or lovingly kind mind, a mind of metta. I also have a light known as pure truth. It arose from always being without deceit.
Okay. Let me pa let me pause one more time, and then we'll do another round. So the only thing I get again wanted to make clear is the way that these are it the, this poem is just really laying out all the dharmas, all of the building blocks. And so we went from the five sensory organs, to the five sensory objects. Then we went to the four elements, earth, fire, water, and wind. And then from those, we went to the five aggregates themselves, right? And then when the one that I just, or the last two that I just read, I also have a light known as pure realms. It arose from always practicing with a mind of metta or a, a lovingly kind mind. Those realms refer basically specifically to the six consciousnesses that arise from the six elements or the six sensory objects and the six sensory organs. So those are this sort of all the mental activity. And it helps to know that that's what the term realms is a reference to, these conscious realms, because then it makes sense that that light arises from practicing with a mind of metta, so a mind of loving kindness. And then the last one that we read, that I read, was about a light known as pure truth. And that arose from always being without deceit. And that's kind of a, a nice segue to the next grouping, where the the interplay between the light and the practice is going to be a little more uh, direct. It's going to be a direct correlation in a really nice way. So for example, the next one is, I also have a light known as pure land. It arose from always practicing giving. I also have a light known as pure tone or a pure note it arose from praising the buddha i also have a light known as pure contemplation it arose from praising samadhi concentration i also have a light known as pure discourse it arose from praising memory. I also have a light known as in harmony with the sun. It arose from harmonizing all divisiveness. I also have a light known as revealing the true meaning. It arose from comprehending the nature of emptiness. I also have a light known as blueness or blue. It arose from offering blue lotuses. I also have a light known as yellowness or yellow. It arose from offering magnolia or uh, kampaka flowers. I also have a light known as red or redness. It arose from offering pearls. I also have a light known as whiteness. It arose from offering golden flowers. I also have a light known as supreme merit. It arose from putting up glorious adornments. I also have a light known as the awe-inspiring majesty of Nagas, and it arose from offering Naga banners. I also have a light known as the awe-inspiring majesty of elephants. It arose from offering elephant banners. I also have a light known as the Lion King. It arose from offering lion banners. I also have a light known as the Ox King. It arose from offering ox banners.
let's yeah let's pause there talk banners for a second and we'll pull back um actually before anything coming up for anybody about like what are we doing here what's this what's going on with this sutra are we doing okay again it's just this is a very different kind of a sutra it's not a story kind it's not a direct teaching kind it's this other kind where it's a it's more um of an experience in that way where it's really just hearing it read and feeling it in that way there's not much more to it than that in that sense um yeah i think that's i'm i'm skipping a few things here and there that i don't think is worth going completely into um yeah so everybody doing okay though let's keep on then so after our light uh from offering ox banners right oh yeah and i was going to mention too just you know the 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 banner is a kind of classic symbol in buddhism and you just have a, all of these different symbols two that come to mind right now are the canopy kind of the umbrella and the banner and each of these symbols in in buddhism they really you know all of these different symbols of course but i just chose those two they they have different aspects to them so for example when thinking of a canopy there's a sense of the way that it is is a a refuge it's protecting it's shielding also though what's kind of lovely about a canopy and buddhism will mention this canopies protect whoever is underneath it indiscriminately they umbrellas don't stop the rain just for some people who are stand underneath them umbrellas stop the rain for everybody underneath them regardless of who they are so canopies have this symbol to them where they are both protecting guarding but then a, a hint of equanimity and so there's these just these symbols that start to have all kinds of significance to them and a canopy is different than a banner and i've i've talked about banners in the past but you know banners have a few different things going on with them the two main things that go on with banners in buddhism is traditionally a banner like in the old 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 ancient world a banner would be a sign of victory you would raise the victory banner and so what they talk about in an interesting way in buddhism are banners of victory but it's a particular battle that has been won it's a particular enemy that has been defeated the enemy that has been defeated is mara is death itself and the battle was the battle of the buddha under is the is the buddha under the bodhi tree confronted by mara and so when they talk about banners in buddhism they're kind of referencing the defeat of mara so the defeat of of what mara represents the clashes greed anger delusion death the cycle of birth death and rebirth so a banner in buddhism is about the victory over mara but then there's another aspect to banners too which is that in the ancient world banners were a form of telecommunication so a form of communicating at distances nowadays we use telephones and telegraphs or they used to be used telegraphs but before telegraphs and telephones and the internet there were banners so you could raise a really large banner and somebody very far away could see it 
and be like, oh, they won over there. And then they could raise a banner to let people over there know that those that they won. And you could have a relay of banners. And so the, the relay of banners became a way of communicating at vast distances. And there's a way in which banners have both this symbolism of victory and the significance of telecommunication. And it's why, well, I don't wanna to go too far off on banners, but it's why the word for banner in, in uh, Sanskrit, uh, divajya, it can also be a sign by which they mean both like a sign, like an open sign or closed, but also like an, a sign, like an omen. So banners are ominous, victorious, and kind of telecommunicating. So they have all of that going on. And the animals that got referenced here, by the way, the lion, the ox, the elephant, and the naga are sort of these, um, well, animals of victory in that sense and conquest. Okay, everybody good? Let's keep going because we're already, by the way, that's the 73rd stanza. We're practically done with the first part of the first poem. <laughs> so the Buddha goes on to say, I also have a light known as pure moon. It arose from cleaning Buddha stupas or Buddha shrines. Take your pick. I also have a light known as Naga Tamer. It arose from offering silk belts. I also have a light known as Yaksha Tamer. It arose from being able to directly perceive the truth. <laughs> I also have a light known as awakening woman. It arose from being free of the characteristics of women. I also have a light known as awakening man. It arose from being free of the characteristics of man. I also have a light known as the awe-inspiring majesty of the Vajra. It arose from the purity of the karmic action of knowledge. I also have a light known as unfolding emptiness. It arose from revealing the karmic results to the world. I also have a light known as awakened to the absolute truth. It arose from being free of wrong views. I also have a light known as elucidating the words of the Buddha. It arose from praising the Dharma dot to. I also have a light known as free from error. It arose from praising superior understanding. I also have a light known as universal illumination of adornments. It arose from praising the giving of lamps. I also have a light known as free from desire. It arose from extolling meditation and wisdom, dhyana and prana. I also have a light known as free from habits. It arose from knowledge of understanding the past. I also have a light known as free from all attachments. It arose from praising the knowledge of non-arising. I also have a light known as 
free from all states of being. It arose from praising the knowledge of non-defilement. I also have a light known as the renunciation of location. It arose from extolling or praising the knowledge of suffering. I also have a light known as miraculous transformations of the Buddhas. It arose from praising the power of miraculous feats. I also have a light known as transcending language games. It arose from praising omniscience. I also have a light known as manifesting forms. It arose from praising spiritual accomplishments. I also have a light known as delighting in spiritual friendship. It arose from praising the nature of enlightenment. I also have a light known as the limit of what is right in front of the eye. It arose from praising the limit of what is right in front of the eye. <laughs> I also have a light known as the limit of the exhaustion of the eye. It arose from praising the inexhaustible. I also have a light, the name of which is unlimited. It arose from praising non-being. I also have a light known as indestructible. It arose from praising the nature of cessation. I also have a light known as the limit of the boundless. It arose from praising the unlimited. I also have a light, the name of which does not have any characteristics. It arose from praising the unconditioned. I also have a light known as unvarying. It arose from praising the undifferentiated. I also have a light, the name of which cannot be entered. It arose from praising non-attachment. I also have a light, the name of which has not yet appeared. It arose from praising the unarisen. I also have a light, the name of which has not arisen. It arose from praising the unmanifested. Okay, so therein concludes the first part of the first poem. There were a lot of juicy bits in the end there. Um, anything jump out? Anybody want to start anywhere? There's a few that I want to go back and address, but I kind of wanted you just to hear kind of the whole thing, at least the way the end sounded. So let's see, where could we begin? Let's go back. So the one, the one that uh, jumps out at me, I mean, I, I could really start to go way back. So let me just start with this one because I thought this one was really interesting. So the, the way that I translate it, let me actually give you the or other translation. Yeah, so in, the, in our book, the one that I read, 
I also have a light known as awakening woman. And it arose from being free of the characteristics of, of, of woman. They translated it a little oddly. They, they translated it as another light called understanding woman. And the Buddha says, I obtained that light by remaining detached from the female appearance. So I think that's a really good one just to, for us to kind of bite down on and kind of tear apart in that in the linguistic way. So there's a few different ways to translate, but the, the words are very clear that the words that are used for awakening, enlightenment. So to digress or to like uh, water it down a little bit and just call it understanding is not really so great on the part of our original translators. So it does seem to be saying something like either I have a light that is known as a, a woman who is awakened or a light that awakens women. It's not exactly clear how the grammar is functioning on the name of the light, but it's pretty clear in terms of what brings this light about. And the light, it says, is brought about by being free of the characteristics of women or woman in that sense. And of course, the, that word characteristic is that word lakshana that we're always talking about on Sunday nights, the quality or the characteristic of being a woman in this case. And of course, the very next uh, stanza is about, I also have a light known as the awakening of man. And it arose from being free of the characteristics of man. So those are kind of a nice place to start just to kind of, to work with one idea tonight. And I already mentioned at the beginning of this talk that these lights, the attainment of these lights, the very nature of these lights, it definitely seems to have a lot to do with emptiness, with this understanding of emptiness, this unique teaching of emptiness. And, you know, the, the idea here is the idea here of being free of the characteristics of, say, woman or man. The, a very, very uh, I'll try to, we don't even really have that much time, but the, a really easy, quick way that I explain this, or that I would explain this, I often use this example to talk about the empty nature of all characteristics, which is to say the empty nature of all lakshana, all qualities. The one example that I really like to use is the idea that you might think I'm tall, or you might think I'm short, one or the other, right? Heck, you could even think I'm like medium, medium height. So whether you think I'm tall, whether you think I'm short, whether you think I'm medium, whatever it is, the idea is, is that if I were standing in a room full of people and everybody else in the room, their head was here and I'm way up here, you would be inclined to think that I'm tall. And, uh, and in particular, I want to say it really clearly, you may be inclined to think tallness is a characteristic or a quality of Michael. But that's very easily disproved because if I go into another room that's full of giant basketball players that are all seven feet and taller, all of a sudden, I'm not so tall anymore. But what happened to my tallness? <laughs> I used to be a tall guy, right? And now I'm not tall anymore. Well, when I move from one room to the other, and all of a sudden, I'm not the tallest person in the room or not tall at all, what that does is it reveals 
that I that tallness is not a quality that's out here. Tallness is would be then a quality in that's kind of in the eye of the beholder, as as they say. That the tallness doesn't have anything to do with being this. It has everything to do with what you're used to in that sense, or what else you're looking at. And if you're looking at a bunch of people up here and one person there, you're, you're, you're going to say that's a short person, but that's not intellectually honest, at least from a Buddhist point of view. It's not honest and true to say that they are short, they are tall. It's, it's a statement about one's conditioned thought patterns, but it's not a statement about the quality of Michael in that way. If you can understand how it is that I'm not tall or short, if you can really wrap your head around that idea of how a quality or a characteristic like height, like being tall, if you can understand how that is, how it appears to be a characteristic out here, but how it's really not, then what you could do is, is you could start to realize all characteristics and qualities are like that. They might appear to be a property of a person or of an object, but the realization is, is that no characteristic or quality actually exists out there. They're all going to, there are all these dependent ideas. Tall is dependent upon short, right? Male is dependent upon female. And so now, if I'm not tall, right, what characteristics or qualities do you use to consider me male? Is it my my deep voice, maybe my deep voice is this indicator of maleness, right? But deep voice is a quite a characteristic or a quality that you're attributing to me. But the idea is, is that that's on you. That's your auditory receptors, hearing it be a low voice and therefore attributing to that the characteristic or the quality of being male. But if I'm not tall, if I don't have a deep voice, and if you keep stripping, say Michael in this case, but if you keep realizing that the qualities aren't, aren't out here, you can eventually realize how the characteristic or the quality of being male or female is not here. It's again, just going to be in the eye of the beholder in terms of what the beholder is used to. And so if they're conditioned to see, you know, it's, it's at this point that I'm always tempted to take my hair down so I can have one of the characteristics of a female, which is long hair, right? But there I would have the long hair, all of these things. So the idea is, is that the, this light known as the awakening of woman, it arises from being free of the characteristics of woman. And I would suggest that that, um, I would suggest that that goes both ways. And what I mean by both ways is that one would, that light, that particular light would come from being free of the characteristics of woman or man in one's judgment of others and also in one's ju judgment of oneself in that way. So being free of that delusion of that boxy category, right, is kind of the idea. And by the way, too, if you just want to have a little emptiness fun, the real, the, what you realize is if you take away my height, 
my gender, sex, all of those things, and you keep taking away all of these characteristics or these qualities, you will eventually pull them all away and reveal the empty nature, well, of me in that case, but of all things. So my point is, is that you can come to a deeper understanding of emptiness when you kind of realize what something is, is it's, you understand it because of characteristics and qualities. And if all of a sudden those characteristics and qualities are not out there as properties of a thing, then you realize, oh, there's nothing out there then in that way. It's all in the eye of the beholder in that sense. So anything regarding that? The light of awakening man or awakening woman? Cool. So I wanted to introduce those because then you get to this next one. Actually, I'm skipping one, but I also have a light known as unfolding emptiness. It arose from revealing karmic results to the world. That's a very, very interesting one there. And actually, that one's probably going to take, take me a little bit of time to unpack there, but it's an interesting idea. So the most interesting thing, and it's not even actually maybe interesting so much as it's important. One of the most important things about this idea of emptiness that we were just talking about is that despite <laughs> the empty nature of all phenomena, despite the empty nature of all characteristics and qualities, despite emptiness, there is still karma, by which I mean karmic results. And at first that seems paradoxical because if everything is empty, then there's no karmic results. How, what, what it doesn't make any sense. And there is a way in which I understand that it, it does seem contradictory in that way. But this is where Buddhism has a much more subtle understanding of karma than some other philosophical religious traditions. What I mean to say is, is that, well, actually, I can just summarize this very quickly. I just found a nice quick summary. The idea is, is that in so far as you haven't realized emptiness, insofar as you are still attributing to me the characteristics and qualities of, say, being male in that way, what we can talk about is how that is a result of, quote, unquote, your karma, by which I mean your past actions, your past conditioning in that sense. And so, the, in other words, actually, how would I say that in other words? In, in other words, it's, it, you know, emptiness is really sort of one of these all or nothing kind of a things. It's kind of like you either really have this penetrating, complete understanding of emptiness, or you're still kind of attached to all of these various things, including the self. And so you're going to be in a karmic situation, and by which I mean one with karmic consequences. But the idea here is, is that those two things, those two ideas, emptiness and karmic consequences, they can kind of exist side by side. In fact, right now, right here, they are existing side by side in that way. And so it's sort of this kind of subtle distinction between understanding the empty nature of all things and realizing, wow, there is no karma, but then that's fully within the realm of emptiness. As soon as you are attached to the slightest dharma, <laughs> the idea is, is that all of this, this experience you're having is 
in a sense, a karmic result, but it's not a karmic result of like past lifetimes. It's the karmic result of your actual habituated conditioned mental formation right now. So that's sort of my best attempt at explaining the light known as unfolding emptiness, which arises from revealing karmic results to the world. Again, the idea is, is that the, the results here are not cumulative from the past in that way. They're this present mode of thinking. And so karma is very kind of subtly different in, in the world of Mahayana Buddhism in particular for that idea. And by the way, the next one, just to keep going on this kind of explanatory uh, mode, the one that says, I also have a light known as awakened to the absolute truth. It arose from being free of wrong views. Emptiness in this sense is the right view. <laughs> And thinking I'm tall, thinking I'm male, thinking all of those conditioned habitual things is sort of wrong view. And so being free of wrong views brings about this light called awakened to the absolute truth. And then I wanted to jump down. Yeah, let's just do the last part because it's so beautiful. So the very last part, just the last few, I really, of course, really like the one that says, I also have a light known as delighting in spiritual friendship. It arises from praising the nature of enlightenment. I think that's a, a lovely light that we participate in here in the Dharma doors with our spiritual friendship here. Then we have this really cryptic one, which takes, it took me a really long time to even figure out what they were saying. The way that I translate it is, I also have a light known as the limit of what is right in front of the eye. It, ar it arises, that light arises from praising the limit of what is right in front of the eye. Such a weird line, such a weird sentence. And they do really seem to be, well, they, they seem to be speaking about the limits of vision, the, the limits of how far, these, how far these eyes can take you in that way. And then the last, few of these, which I really wanted to comment on these, but linguistically, there's a beautiful thing that happens in the last uh, five or six of these. So he says, I also have a light, the name of which is, is unlimited. There's no, it, 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 um, like it basically it's a name that has no bound boundaries is he says. And you know, the way that you can imagine that is like an infinite string of letters. An infinite string of letters just goes on. So you could, you, you could never finish saying the name. It's, that, it's limitless, right? So he says, I also have a light, the name of which is unlimited. It arose from praising non-being. I also have a light known as indestructible. It arose from praising the nature of cessation. The nature of cessation, by the way, again, cessation is nirodha. That's the cessation of suffering. That's like the kind of basically nirvana, that the goal of Buddhism in that way. And so praising, so not nirodha, not cessation, praising cessation brings about a light of called indestructible 
I also have a light known as the limit of the boundless. It arose from praising the unlimited. So that's a particularly funny one there. The, <laughs> let me just try to read it one more time. I also have a light known as the limit of the limitless is basically what it's, it's an absolute paradox, but so the limit of the limitless, it arose from praising the unlimited. So there's this funny language thing going on there, which then I also have a light. And the grammar changes here which I find really interesting. I also have a light, but the name of it, the name of which, it doesn't have any lakshana. It doesn't have any characteristics. It arose from praising the unconditioned. And unconditioned, by the way, you can understand as the, do we even have this word in English? Un, unrelative. If you're talking about relativity, like this is relative to that, and tall is relative to short, and in fact, everything is relative to everything else. Do we have a word for the unrelative? I don't know if we do have such a word, but that in Buddhism, they call it the unconditioned, asamskrita. So you have samskrita, asamskrita. And there's this beautiful line, I have a light, the name of which has no characteristics. It arises from praising the unconditioned. I have a light known as unvarying. It arises from praising the undifferentiated. I also have a light, the name of which can't be entered. It arose from praising non-attachment. I also have a light, the name of which has yet to appear. It arose from praising the unarisen. I also have a light, the name of which has not arisen. It arose from praising the unmanifested. So the very end of that poem, it kind of, uh, leapfrogs on itself, all of these different adjectives. The one thing I want to leave you with on all of those notes, which is this idea that I have a light, the name of which has yet to come into existence, basically. It's, it has yet to arise, right? And he says that it comes, it arises or it comes into existence, right, from praising the unarisen. So that idea of the unarisen, that which has yet to come into existence, that is a very subtle place to place one's mind. There's a, a Zen saying, which is, what did your face look like before you were born? That Zen koan of what did your face look like before you were born is the same idea of, of meditating on the unarisen. It's a very subtle place to put the mind on that which has yet to come into existence. It's, it's akin to meditating on that which has no characteristics. How do you think of that which has no characteristics? If it has no color or shape or size, it doesn't make a sound, doesn't make a smell, doesn't taste like anything, doesn't feel like anything, and you actually don't even have any media, any sense media to even formulate an idea. How do you think of that which has no characteristics? It's a very subtle place to put the mind, and I would suggest that that's why they're saying that some of these lights arise from praising the unarisen. I'm praising the unarisen by saying it's a very special place to put the mind. <laughs> All right, on that subtle note of the unarisen, I'm going to call it a night. We did it. First hundred verses.
Thanks for being here.